Appreciate y'all for tuning in, man. It's Mr. Humbly Humbly Gabos. We got the twisted case of Darius Miles true crime documentary. Get right into it. Well, Jamia Harris was just 23 years old. She was a mother. She had a five year old son. Her family tells me she is loved by so many. Every person I spoke with today say this is just heartbreaking. I swear. In the world of crime, a story came to light that left us all stunned. We delve into the baffling life of Darius Miles, a 21 year old former Alabama basketball player, and the shocking events that led him and his accomplice Michael Lynn Davis to commit a heinous. D did that shit say capital murder? Of Darius Miles, a 21 year old former Alabama basketball player, Alabama. and the shocking events that led him and his accomplice Mike. Charged with capital murder. Damn, that's not a goal you want to set at 21, bro. Michael Lynn Davis to commit a heinous act. <laughs> shooting Jamia while she sat in a car with her boyfriend. Oh my God. Darius Miles' life began in Washington, D.C., where he was born on October. That shit sound like Iraq, bro. Like, how many shots did he have to let off? Damn. 6, 2001. After attending the IMG Academy in Bradenton, Florida, he headed to Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa is well known as the home of the University of Alabama, one of the most prestigious and renowned universities in the United States, especially for its storied football program and passionate sports culture. The city gained immense popularity for its college football team, the Alabama Crimson Tide, which has a rich history of success and a dedicated fan base. Darius Miles was a basketball player at Alabama Crimson Tide for more than three years. When he finished high school, 247 Sports Composite gave him three stars. He also held a 159 international ranking. He had offers from Georgetown, Seton Hall, Rhode Island, and Rutgers, but he chose Alabama. Little did he know that this choice would end his basketball career That's right crazy. then and there. Following the tragic murder of Jamea Harris, UA made a solemn announcement on Sunday, January 15th, 2023, declaring the removal of Darius Miles from the Crimson Tide basketball team. In their statement, they expressed heartfelt sympathy to Jamea's family and friends who had been affected by this dreadful and unforgivable incident. <coughs> Miles was in Alabama to attend the LSU game at Coleman Coliseum on Saturday, alongside the team. However, prior to the game, he had already been ruled out of the season due to an ankle injury limiting his playtime to just six games. Throughout the season, he had been battling with ankle problems from the very start. Additionally, Miles had to miss some games due to personal reasons, as disclosed by coach Nate Oates. His playing time this season averaged 6.5 minutes per game with no starting appearances. His last game was on December 20th against Jackson State. In the previous season, he participated in 30 games and started in two averaging 17.2 minutes per game. According to Tracy, Darius's mother, he found himself feeling rejuvenated and determined after his trip back home. In a way, being sidelined for the season turned out to be a relief for him, as it provided enough time for healing and regaining his energy before the start of the spring semester. He was home to cope with the ankle injury that he got earlier during the preseason. On the evening of January 14th, it was meant to be the last gathering with Tracy Harris and Darius's stepfather, Dwight, at Half Shell Oyster House. Darius joined them for dinner on that occasion. Michael, a cherished friend of Miles since their middle school days, shared a deep bond with the family and joined them at the gathering. Growing up in Landover, Maryland, Michael harbored dreams of pursuing a career in the NFL. His huddle page showcases a plethora of thrilling highlights, reflecting his passion as a young defense. Page showcases a plethora of dreams of pursuing a career in the nfl his huddle that's henry ruggs peep games uh homie over here dude is about i think he's facing 10 years just through his whole nfl career away killed someone while driving like 130 miles an hour and killed a woman and her dog bro like i'll never understand how drunk drivers the drunk drivers never die they, ne they never die it's, it's always the person that don't see him coming and like he threw his life away too so it's kind of crazy they included him in this clip yo what's up with these kids yo page showcases a plethora of thrilling highlights, reflecting his passion as a young defensive back, eagerly seeking college recruitment. During his senior year, he committed to McDaniel College, 
a Division III school in Westminster, Maryland, and eagerly anticipated embarking on his football journey. Hailing from the vibrant city of Birmingham, 23-year-old Jamea Harris set out for Tuscaloosa to reunite with her boyfriend. Little did she- front. I feel like something's always happening in Tuscaloosa. I don't know, maybe I watch too much First 48, but every single time they always kind of pull up to that area whenever they got something crazy to share with us, huh? Tuscaloosa. I hear more about that shit on First 48 than, than for anything. Anything. She know that this seemingly fun journey would become a harrowing twist of fate, leading her down a dark and ominous path, one that would demand a heartbreaking price for very life. The story of Jamea Harris's murder starts with Tuscaloosa's celebration over the number four Alabama men's basketball team's dominating 106 to 66 victory against LSU. What a performance though by Alabama. I got that. I know the number me. beside their name says four, but they now have 106 in the game. Everyone headed towards the strip. The strip, situated just west of the University of Alabama campus and centered along University Boulevard is a vibrant district renowned for its retail and nightlife offerings. Jamea, along with her boyfriend Cedric Johnson and cousin Asia Humphrey, arrived at the strip at night. They joined the line outside 1225, where Darius, Miller, and Bradley were also present. However, since the line was too long, Miller decided to go to a restaurant instead, and they decided to leave the queue and head elsewhere. According to Darius's attorney, Jim Standridge, it was confirmed that Jamea's group and Darius's group came close to each other around midnight, but they did not interact. Cedric decided to wait there for the food, while Jamea and Asia returned to the Jeep. At 1.02 a.m., Darius texted Miller and asked him where he could pick him up. Darius's group exited the bar and began crossing the street. Michael was slightly ahead of the others, adjusting the hood on his jacket as he passed by the Jeep where Jamea and Asia were sitting. As per the court testimony, Michael halted by the Jeep and began dancing, clearly intoxicated from tequila. Cedric informed the police that when he attempted to ask Michael to leave, Michael retorted by claiming, You don't know who I am. You don't know what I do. Darius's attorney asserted that he was the one attempting to de-escalate the situation, and Bradley confirmed this claim. Asia testified that she did not hear Darius saying anything to anyone in the Jeep. As reported by the police during their interaction, Either James or Asia handed something to Cedric, who was seated in the back seat. Cedric insisted it was food, but Darius told the police that it was a gun. According to police testimony, at 1.38 a.m., Darius sent a text message to Miller, requesting him to bring his gun because they felt threatened by some individuals. Darius's attorney stated that Cedric became upset due to Michael dancing in front of the Jeep, leading him to exit the vehicle to talk to his friends across the street. After their conversation, Cedric returned to the Jeep and drove off with the headlights. During that time, at 1.43 a.m., Miller's car arrived and parked behind Bradley's car, and then Darius exited from Bradley's car. In an attempt to escape from the fight, Jamea's Jeep made a left turn onto Gray Street and then turned around, coming to a stop behind Bradley's car. Afterward, Darius returned to Miller's car and opened the passenger door on the right side while Michael occupied the seat on the left. Darius proceeded to search through some clothes in the car. Based on the court testimony, they engaged in a conversation regarding the phrase, the heat being in the hat, and whether there was one in the head, which referred to whether the gun was loaded. As per Jim Standridge's account, Miller remained inside his vehicle throughout and never made any contact with the gun. Moreover, he fully cooperated with the police later. Darius approached his girlfriend and guided both her and her friend toward the alley behind the Houndstooth parking lot. Subsequently, he made stops at both Bradley's and Miller's cars before proceeding down Gray Street. As he passed the Jeep, he had his hood up, but it was down when he walked past it again. At 1.45 a.m., Michael returned to Gray Street and headed to the driver's side of the Jeep, which was still positioned behind Miller's car. Shortly after Michael approached the passenger side of the car, the first shot was fired. During the February 21st hearing, Tuscaloosa Police Investigator Brandon Culpepper gave testimony stating that Michael was the first to open fire into the Jeep. In response to Michael initiating the shooting at the Jeep, Cedric retaliated with gunfire. Based on video evidence, it was observed that after two shots were fired, Michael fell backward, 
Court testimony indicates that Michael sustained a gunshot wound in the shoulder. As soon as the first gunshots were heard, Michael's car accelerated and left the scene. Another video depicts Michael running across Gray Street and into the alley behind the Houndstooth parking lot while firing his gun at the Jeep. During this incident, the gunshots also struck the windshield of Miller's car, which had an unnamed passenger. A photo evidence displayed bullet holes in Miller's car's windshield, with one on the bottom side and another in the middle of the passenger side. As Michael fled, both Cedric and Miller drove off, but it remained uncertain where Miller was headed. Cedric turned left onto University Boulevard and came to a stop at the Walk of Champions in front of Bryant-Denny Stadium, where they encountered the police. Tragically, Jamea was discovered dead in the passenger seat of her Jeep. It was disclosed that Darius was the individual who gave Michael the gun, but he maintains that he provided it for protection purposes and not with oh, the intention of harming anyone. That does not matter in the court of law, bro. That does not matter at all. You could have got the gun and gave it to your homeboy to decorate. If that boy let off a shot, Heck, he could have killed himself. They would have charged you with it. <laughs> I just got to keep it a beam. That nigga could have shot himself and you would have got charged with murder, bro. Regardless of whether, regardless of the reason why you gave him the gun, you gave him a weapon that he used and it led to someone being killed. I mean, what else did you think was going to happen? Even if it was for protection, you still, it's a lethal weapon. You're still going to kill someone. Like, there's still going to be responsibility at hand. Like, wow, son. And Shorty's just, like, it appears like she's a casualty of war. One. Michael's attorney also contends that Michael did not initiate the gunfire, asserting that Cedric was the first to open fire. However, regardless of who fired the first shot, the tragic outcome remains unchanged. Jamea Harris, a young and promising mother to a five-year-old son, lost her life that night. On January 15th, Tracy and Dwight Harris anxiously waited outside the Tuscaloosa County Sheriff's Office, hoping to catch a glimpse of Miles or speak with him. However, they were informed that it wasn't possible. The hours dragged on, and at first police assured Tracy that Miles was cooperating. At first, they were under the impression that he would be released soon, but the situation took an unexpected turn. Authorities revealed that additional evidence had surfaced, prompting them to reconsider. Eventually, the police returned with the distressing news that Miles would face a capital murder charge. In Alabama, using a deadly weapon while the victim is in a vehicle is one of the factors that can lead to such a severe charge. Tracy and Dwight Harris witnessed Miles being escorted out of the sheriff's office, his hands restrained in handcuffs. Like, I don't know how many examples we need to keep seeing of this same scenario where the young college athlete comes from nothing, makes it into third division um, college, has an opportunity to change his life, and he throws it all away because of a moment, because of an argument, uh, because of wrong place at the wrong time. I tell people, it, it's a little eerie, but I was just telling my partner this. Half of us are going to die by the hands of someone we never even met before. Never. That's just, there's just too many people on this planet to avoid that from being a reality. I doubt this woman even knew who this guy was, you know, but wrong place at the wrong time cost her her life. And you could cry as many tears as you want, man. You can't undo that day, bro. You was gangster when you wanted your partner to pull up with the pistol, you know what I mean? And when you handed it to him and, oh, I didn't shoot first, he shot first. I mean, I always say, if you ever gotta go to a certain spot and you need to bring a gun with you, you probably shouldn't go to that certain area, bro. This doesn't even look like beef, this look like spontaneous drunk bullshit. You getting on someone's nerves and someone's drunk, things go left a little quick, people talking crazy. You know how it is. These niggas are 21, 22. Ain't nobody got respect for nobody. Don't ain't, don't nobody know no self-love at 21, 22. You're not thinking about the consequences. You're thinking about the action. That's what always occurs with the, with the youthful mind. Like, we're never able to process the consequences behind our actions. We just think of the entitlement. We just think of, yo, I'm gonna do this because I gotta do it. But you're not really thinking you might potentially be facing a capital murder charge and throwing away your whole college basketball career and professional basketball career. Everything is gone, bro. Everything is gone. You can't even reset life at that point. You're 
you're screwed. I'm trying to stop cursing on my platform. I'm working on it. You know what I mean? But you know what I really meant to say. He done. He's cooked. Even if he bounced back, we'll, we'll find this nigga in China somewhere. He ain't going to the pros with this kind of resume. I'll tell you that much. Shit. China. During the bonds hearing, Tracy Harris and Annie Michael gave testimony, assuring the court that they would ensure their son's full cooperation with all I mean, that is if he doesn't go to jail for the rest of his life. I almost forgot that <laughs> into the equation. Like, what am I saying? Conditions. Despite their pleas, Judge Joanne Janik denied the bond request for Miles and Michael. If they are indicted, Miles and Michael will face separate trials. As the youthful offender application was submitted, beat, Michael's bro. capital murder case was like, look how he looked. This kid like 21, 22. Look Michael, how he walked. If they are indicted, Miles. How many sleepless nights you think brother man has endured since that night? Y'all got to learn from this. Like the young folks that be watching my shit, y'all got to learn from this. Share this with your partners. Share this with your kids. Like y'all got to learn from this. Like there are consequences behind poor decisions in life and they don't always have to be lethal. Just look at everything. Everything we do, like one of the greatest uh, freedoms and gifts that we take for granted is the ability to, to, to own our own freedom. You know what it feel like to have like 24 hour lockdown? You know what I mean? You don't have your phone. You don't got no women. You don't got no distractions. You got to be locked in a box because of something that you did that you can't undo. And they're holding you here while you await trial where they might potentially just say, yo, you're going to be here the rest of your life. This shit is avoidable, bro. It really is. And to watch this, man, this dude walking around like Humpty Dumpty. He, yo, he's aged in dog years in that building. 22 out here looking like 45. And Michael will face separate trials. As the youthful offender application was submitted, Michael's capital murder case was subsequently sealed, preventing public access to court records for the time being. Michael is now hopeful that the judge will grant his case a youthful offender status under Alabama law. Should the judge approve the application, Michael's trial would not involve a jury. In the event of conviction by the judge, he would face a maximum of three years in prison, and his case would remain concealed from public view moving forward. However, if the judge rejects the application, Michael would be treated like any other adult capital murder suspect and could potentially face the death penalty. On the other hand, Darius's bond request was denied, leading to a longer stay in jail compared to Michael. The parents of James Harris felt a sense of relief upon hearing that Darius's bond request was denied once more. This decision offered them some comfort, as they believe it is crucial that Darius receives the appropriate punishment for his actions. There is a possibility that the judge might reconsider and grant Darius's bond in a few months. Nevertheless, for the present time, both Michael and Darius will remain incarcerated. The uncertainty of the situation weighs heavily on both families as they navigate the legal system in hopes of securing the best possible outcomes for their sons. The sealed nature of Michael's case adds an additional layer of complexity, leaving concerned parties anxious for updates. The prospect of Michael being granted youthful offender status presents contrasting possibilities, either a relatively lenient sentence or the grave consequences that accompany now a capital murder charge. You now you wanna cry you a kid, but before you strain them talking about you don't know who I am, I guess we all know who you are. You a kid now, huh? You want that adolescent treatment. You want a slap on the wrist. Oh, all right. Before all this, you was a gangster. <laughs> Look how time flies. The decision lies in the hands of the judge, who must carefully weigh the evidence and circumstances That's surrounding tough. the case. In the meantime, Michael and Darius's families are enduring the emotional toll of seeing their loved ones behind bars. The legal process can be slow and difficult, leaving them in a state of limbo as they await the judge's decisions. The fate of both young men hangs in the balance, and the uncertainty of their futures casts a cloud over the entire situation. The public's curiosity remains piqued as they wait for updates on the case. However, with the record sealed, the inner workings of the legal proceedings remain shielded from prying eyes. This lack of information adds to the mystery and speculation surrounding the events that unfolded on that fateful night. The tragic story of Jamea Harris's death involves the actions of the Alabama men's basketball team and her acquaintances on the same night, leading to a devastating chain of events that unfolded in just eight minutes. Secrets, decisions, and unexpected meetings all come together in a sorrowful turn of events, leaving a profound impact on everyone involved. 
like it's so crazy man um r.i.p to the woman that died like even in the headlines like we give a mad clout to darius miles meanwhile he alive but meanwhile the victim is not even mentioned anywhere here i kind of lost track of her name and whatnot no disrespect but how many times are you gonna keep seeing this yo how many times are you gonna keep seeing this i'm not gonna stop reacting to this cause this shit gonna keep blowing my mind because we're watching our young men out here just throw their lives away for nothing for self-respect for, for wanting to be tough for not being able to walk away from a situation and I, like nothing good happens whenever you bring a gun anywhere especially at that age when you involve alcohol this should just piss me the hell off bro because this should be so avoidable and it'd be the people that don't got nothing to do with shit that end up being the casualties of war i'm gonna holler at you guys in the next video man this was the twisted case of darius miles whatever happened to him happened to him man either way you can't bring that girl back my brother